Sahra, and welcome, Raja. Um, I already started a, uh, an introduction of you to the 65 people who are eagerly awaiting uh, you to say a few words. I mentioned the fact uh, that you are a distinguished lawyer, that you are the founder of the pioneering Palestinian human rights uh, organization, Al Haq. Uh, I mentioned the fact that you're the author of several acclaimed books, including the Orwell Prize winning uh, a book, Palestinian Walks. And I've mentioned the fact that you were honored by the Royal Society of Literature um, by being named as one of 12 writers around the world who is an international writer of the society in the UK. I mentioned also that you live in Ramallah, where you are, I think, today. Um, yeah, I am. Um, I just want to say two other things before I give the floor to you to talk about this wonderful book, uh, We Could Have Been Friends, uh, My Father and I, A Palestinian Memoir, which was the subject of our of our event uh, this e this afternoon and this evening. Um, I started to make a list of your books, Reja, and I realized that I don't even have a complete list of them. I have most of them, but I don't. Um, one of your first books was a book published in 1982 called The Third Way. Um, another was a book published in 1984 called Samid Journalist, a journal of a West Bank Palestinian. Some of these have different titles in the UK edition and the US edition. And I'm reading mainly right. the US edition titles. Um, and then you published a really important volume called Occupier's Law, Israel and the West Bank in 1985 uh, with the Institute for Palestine Studies. In 2002, you published Strangers in the House. In 2003, you published When the Birds Stopped Singing. Uh, and then in 2008, you published your uh, uh, Orwell Prize winning book, Palestinian Walks, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, since then, you've published one, two, three, four, at my, by my count, another six books. Um, 2010, A Rift in Time, which is a wonderful mediation between history and the present. Um, in 2012, Occupation Diaries. In 2015, Language of War, Language of Peace. 2017, The Line is Drawn. 2019, Going Home, A Walk Through 50 Years of Occupation. Um, and then in 2022, this book that we're going to be talking about today, uh, We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I. Um, a Palestinian memoir. Um, in addition, I, I, as I, as we, as, 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 as uh, I should mention, you co-published a couple of books with Penny Johnson, with your, with your wife. Um, one of them is uh, Seeking Palestine: New Palestinian Writings on Exile and Home, which was published in 2013, and another is Shifting Sands: The Unraveling of the Old Order in the Middle East, published in 2017. These are co-edited volumes with Penny, who also has written her own books. So um, the other thing I wanted to say is that in between writing more than a dozen books um, uh, and, in and, and, and for many years running Al Haq, uh, we also spend a couple of years together in the negotiations in Washington, um, the uh, Palestinian Israeli, uh, futile Palestinian Israeli negotiations, uh, which you left uh, realizing their futility a little before I left them. Um, perhaps during questions and answers, you might want to talk about that. But let us now move to talking about this book of yours. Um, and I'm going to give you the floor to say a few words about it. And then I'll have, a, I'll have a little bit to say about it myself. And then we'll open the floor for questions. So please, Fadla Raja. Do I have 40 minutes to speak about the book? You have as much time as you want. I mean, you can speak for less if you'd like. Um, the whole session, uh, I believe we have until... Uh, about 1.30 our time. So we have a little more than an hour and a quarter. So if you want to speak for a part of that um, as much as you want, but, uh, or as little as you want, or if you want to read some of the, some of whatever you, whatever you choose to do. Thank you. You're the author. Thank you, uh, Rashid. I want to start by reading uh, from the book, just a few pages from the beginning of the book. I could hear him entering the office with his usual gusto. As always, I took a deep breath when my father came in. He stopped at the reception to get the latest messages and asked, has anyone called? With small quick steps thumping the ground, he walked past my room, followed by his secretary, to whom he was already dictating letters concerning the day's court hearings. He was wearing his dark suit with a well-ironed white shirt and the black tie and carrying his heavy black leather briefcase. Then he doubled back 
and peered through the open door to my room. He saw me looking over a map covered in cobweb lines and asked accusingly, what are you doing? Don't you have any work to do? Before I could explain, he had darted into his office to resume dictating. I stayed in my office, examining the new 1984 military order, plus the attached map that my father had seen me with. Road plan number 50, as it was designated, was the blueprint for the Israeli Occupation Authority's long-term objective of creating a new West Bank road network that was bound to have a devastating effect on the Palestinian landscape, on traditional towns and villages and agricultural areas. Studying it, I could see where the future roads were to be built, how the existing network of roads was to be altered from a north-south to an east-west grid, and how the Jordan Valley was to get a new road, one that would better connect it to Israel and consolidate it as the country's eastern border. The implications were massive. I gave my father time to finish dictating his letters, then I walked over to his office to show him the new order and map. When I suggested to him that we should submit objections to the proposal, he was not enthusiastic. He didn't seem to share my sense of foreboding about the impact that the order could, would have on the land. The phone rang and he answered, Aziz Shahadi here, can I help you? Waving me away, he sank into a conversation with his client. But I continued to think about the new road plan. A few weeks earlier, I had taken a solitary drive down what we then called the Latrun Road, since it linked the hilly town of Ramallah to the coastal city of Jaffa via the Latrun Monastery. On both sides of the road, I could see terraced hills dotted with olive trees in full leaf. The trees on the slopes of these undulating hills were all approximately the same height, and they were all olives. As I drove northwest, the hills were awash with sunlight, and the trees cast their shadows over the brown earth all the way down to the wadi. On the hill to my right was a plot that, he, that, had, that belonged to my client. He had just heard that the occupation authorities had expropriated it and were planning to establish Beit Haron, a settlement for Israeli Jews. I couldn't understand why. What was the point of putting Israeli civilians in the midst of our hills, so close to a Palestinian village? How would these settlers get their electricity and water? They couldn't depend on the inadequate services from the nearby village. Could they possibly have plans for an alternative network of infrastructure? It was then that the worrying thought struck me like lightning. What if our Israeli occupiers, who already had total control of the network serving us, were proposing to construct a superior network for water, electricity, and roads connect connecting the settlements to Israel? That would, mean, <clears throat> that would mean they could cut us off without affecting their own people. We would be completely at their mercy for essential services. When I saw the military order announcing the new road plan, I feared that the Israeli military was taking the first step to prepare the way for this eventuality. As you can glean from the reading, I was attempting to recruit my father to assist me in, in resisting the consequences of the 1967 occupation of the West Bank, Eastern Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. He had a long history of resisting the consequences of the 1948 Nakba. But this book is not about, only about our resistance against oppression. It also describes a psychological portrait of a complicated and challenging father-son relationship. Just as I was setting off to write my book, a friend brought me a photocopy of the Palestine Telephone Directory of Jaffa Tel Aviv, dated January 1944. There I found my father's office number and that of my grandfather, Judge Salim, listed as his honor, Salim Shahadi. Emotions overwhelmed me. All that history of their life in Jaffa is denied, just like my father's history of political activism on behalf of Palestine has been erased. This was the catalyst that started me thinking about father's legacy and work. 
I was slowly getting ready to open that cabinet where I kept father's files and look inside. During my father's final year, as I worked with him on the road plan case, I could see how busy he was with putting his papers in order. I wondered whether he was preparing to write his memoir. He didn't. All those files remained in his house after his death until I eventually moved them to mine. Three years ago, I decided to open them, file after file, neat and well-organized documenting my father's political engagements and important legal cases. They included his assiduous work on the return of the refugees to their homes from which they were forced in 1948. His petition to the British Labour Party against the British commander of the Jordanian army, John Baggett Globe, as well as a number of precedent setting legal cases. For some time, I had been thinking of writing about the Nakbe and the right of return. I had come to believe that the denial by Israel of these was one of the main obstacles to peace. I wanted to evoke the life lived in Jaffa before 1948 to make it real to the reader and describe how it turned out for my family when they were forced out. That is why chapter three is dedicated to describing that life. My father was forced out of Jaffa in April 1948, but he was certain the city would return to Arab hands. According to the 1947 UN partition scheme, it was part of the Arab state. His hopes were raised on December 11, 1948. On that day, the UN General Assembly passed Resolution 194, which stated that, quote, refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practicable date and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return, unquote. On the same day, the UN established the Palestine Conciliation Commission to carry out the resolution, knowing that they could not leave the task to the UN alone. A group of Palestinians, my father among them, established the Ramallah Refugee Congress, later called the Arab Refugee Congress. This represented a total of 300,000 refugees. Its main aim was to uphold the right of the refugees to return to their homes. In April 1949, the Congress was invited to represent Palestine at the Lausanne Conference. This was convened by the UN Palestine Conciliation Commission to resolve disputes arising from the war, especially concerning refugees. My father and three of his colleagues traveled to Lausanne, but were not accepted as a separate delegation. They were stateless, and Israel declared it only negotiated with states. For several years, my father and others continued to look for ways to return home to Palestine. Unbeknown to them, secret negotiations had been underway since 1947, before the British mandate in Palestine ended, between King Abdullah and the Zionist leaders. They both hoped to prevent the birth of a Palestinian state under their common enemy, Hajj Amin Husseini, the Palestinian head of the Arab Higher Committee. At a secret meeting in London in February 1948, Ernst Bevan, the UK Foreign Secretary, gave King Abdullah the green light to snatch part of Palestine, provided that the King's forces stayed out of those areas allotted by the UN partition plan to the Jews. I can almost hear Father's impassioned voice summing up the steps he and other Palestinian leaders had taken to ensure the return of the refugees to their homes and property. We took our case to Lausanne. There, Israel refused to negotiate with us, and the Arab states denied us the right to speak for ourselves. They wanted to speak for us to do what was in their interest, not in ours. We organized and spoke out, sparing no effort to do what we thought was right. And yet, in the end, the initiative was snatched out of our hands, and we were left at the mercy of a leadership that we did not trust. It was a battle waged to determine who would represent the refugees and, is, and Jordan won. 75 years have since passed and Israel continues to deny the Nakbe and refuses to recognize the right of return. The loss of Palestine in 1948 came as a shock and led to decades of despair. Palestinians could not imagine 
that the small Jewish community in Palestine would succeed in driving out most Palestinians from their homes and replacing them with Jews. In part, this was a failure of imagination. It was due to the experiential gap that existed between the zealous Jewish fighters and the unsuspecting Palestinians. How similar all this was to what happened to us after 1967. We also failed to imagine that the Israelis could get away with settling over three quarters of a million Israeli Jews in our midst. A prominent Israeli novelist has repeated what many other Israeli propagandists have said, that the establishment of Israel was nothing short of a miracle. As revelations from the recently opened archives confirm, it was no miracle at all. Given the balance of military power and planning, it was predictable that the Zionists would win the 1948 war against the so-called seven Arab armies that fought to prevent the establishment of the state. The real miracle was Israel's success in ridding the land of its people, persisting in denying what happened and getting away with it. With all our attempts at writing about it, we Palestinians seem not to have made a dent in the way it is seen neither by Israelis nor the outside world. It's important to point out that the oft repeated Israeli fallacy that advocating for the recognition of the right of return is tantamount to advocating for the destruction of Israel is not so. Peace cannot be built on the denial of the history. There were more revelations in my father's papers. One file documented a 1954 case he argued before this district court in Jordan against Barclays Bank. When Israel declared itself a state, it ordered all banks still operating within its territory to freeze the accounts of all their Arab customers and to stop all transactions on all Arab accounts. This meant that the refugees were able, unable to withdraw any from any branch outside Israel the money they had deposited with the Arab and Barclays banks branches in areas now under Israeli control. Israel wanted to turn the Palestinians into beggars. The Israeli strategy could be summed up as no money, no country. My father's case against Barclays Bank succeeded in releasing these assets. He traveled to London to work out procedures for the release of the funds. The Jordanian foreign minister gave a statement to the papers claiming that the negotiations for the release of the funds had taken place with Israel, which the minister said amounted to an act of treason. My father got word that every border point in Jordan had been ordered to arrest him immediately upon his return. This was his reward for winning the case against Israel. He had to spend 27 months in exile, first in London and then in Rome and Beirut before he was able, allowed to return home to Ramallah. In another bulky file lay a memorandum dated June 23, 1955, that my father and his colleague Mohammed al Yahya wrote to members of the British Labour Party during his exile in London. It accused the British commander of the Jordanian army, John Bagot Glob, known in Jordan as Glob Pasha, of the forgeries and the harsh measures that were adopted during the Jordanian parliamentary elections of 1954. Reading this memo, I marveled at my father's fearlessness, and yet his efforts at lobbying the British to remove their man in Jordan seemed overly optimistic. With all he knew of the British and their behavior during the mandate, when they tortured prisoners, demolished homes, and hanged rebels, how could he expect justice from them? Why would they want to change their policies and remove their agent in Jordan just because of my father's accusations? It is to be regretted that the blocked account case was not celebrated by the authorities in Jordan. Nor did it inspire others to use the law in the struggle against Israel. After 1967, the Palestinian leadership took no notice of the case as an example of what could be done to fight illegal Israeli actions. The failure to consider the law as one form of struggle has meant that the PLO neglected to follow and confront Israel's changes to the local law in the occupied West Bank as they were taking place 
during the years of occupation. When negotiations took place in Oslo between Israel and the PLO, the Palestinian negotiators did not insist on reversing these changes that enabled Israel to establish more Jewish settlements and link them to the other side of the Green Line. My father would have been appalled at the total absence of legal grounding for the talks. It was only after a decade of occupation that the possibility of launching legal resistance to the occupation finally took root and began to be accepted and practiced. I was part of that struggle. Through my organization, Al Haq, we challenged Israel's violations of international law, its land grabs, grabs and illegal policy of settling Israelis in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and raised cases against most some of the proposed changes in the law. I also attended UN meetings on the question of Palestine in far-flung corners of the world. How similar my work was to what my father had done three decades earlier. And yet, my father never commented on the similarity between our two struggles and took little interest in my human rights work. In 1983, at a conference in Jakarta, I met his star trainee in Jaffa, Mohammed Al-Farra, who had become Assistant Secretary General of the Arab League of, uh, League of Arab States. When I got back and talked to my father, he was unenthusiastic about the conference and didn't want to hear about it. I could not understand why. Now, years later, I realized what a farce those gatherings were. We would present papers about what was taking place in the occupied territories and then argue endlessly about a concluding statement as if everything rested upon it. But none of it really mattered, neither the papers nor the resolutions. They were read by no one and ended up gathering dust on the shelves of the UN. My father knew this but spared me the revelation. He never told me how his own efforts had ended. Did he per perhaps assume I knew? But how could I? We were not in sync. I had been lagging behind by some 30 years. I was in my prime, going full speed ahead with my work, thinking the world of myself. Having been a slow developer, I was beginning to realize my potential and experience the young manhood that had been interrupted by the start of the Israeli occupation in 1967. I did not want anyone stopping me in my tracks or casting doubt on the work on which I was so enthusiastically engaged. I believed then that I was breaking new ground in legal resistance against Israel. I had no idea that my father had done the same years, years earlier, nor did I know that it was from him that I got my public spirit and the sense of responsibility that made me regret, regard the failures of my people as a personal flaw for which I must bear the blame. It was this that pushed me to write all those articles and books about Israel's policies in the occupied territories, to explain, to document, to advocate. For years, I lived as a son whose world was ruled by a fundamentally benevolent father with whom I was temporarily fighting. I was sure we were moving, always moving toward the ultimate happy family and that one day we would all live in harmony. When he died, I had to wake up from my fantasy. There was not enough time for the rebellion and the dream. The rebellion had consumed all the, all the available time. I turned around to ask my stage manager when the second act would start and found that there was none. I was alone. There was no second act and no stage manager. What hadn't happened in the first act would never happen. Live, life moves in real time. On 14 July 1958, Abdul Karim Qasim led the coup in Iraq that toppled King Faisal II and uncle of the Jordanian monarch, King Hussein. One week later, Fearful that the nationalists and anti-monarchists in Jordan might carry out a similar coup against his regime, Hussein declared a state of emergency and ordered the arrest of a large number of known nationalist leaders. One of those leaders was my father, Aziz Shahadi. He spent two scorching months in the summer at the desert prison of Jafar. I don't remember his return home after that ordeal. I have a memory of seeing a photograph of him with a dark growth of beard covering his face, a shaved head, 
and large, fiery, dark brown eyes? Was this taken at the desert prison and smuggled out? Or was it a false memory, a trick of the imagination? Yet he must have had a long beard, although I don't recall him with one. My sister told me that he was whisked away, probably by my mother, as soon as he arrived home and rushed off to the barbers for a shave so that we would not see him bearded. But I have no memory of that either. How is it that I remember none of this? How is it that his unjust imprisonment under such harsh conditions didn't make my father a hero in my eyes? Years later, I would realize that my attitude toward my father was never one of admiration. Not being aware of the extent and the sheer number of battles he had fought during his lifetime of legal and political struggle for, Palestine, for Palestinian rights, I never understood the measure of his anger, disappointment, and unhappiness. In time, I would have come to appreciate all this and show more kindness and understanding toward him. He was healthy and took good care of himself. Yet his death in 1985 at the hands of a murderer left no more time for that. The murderer was a squatter on a land in Hebron belonging to the Anglican church against whom my father was handling an eviction case. He probably acted as an Israeli collaborator. My father's experience and accumulated knowledge during his years of political activities convinced him that the Palestinians could not rely on the Arab states. They needed to take the initiative to call for the establishment of a state of their own. The central struggle, he resolved, should be for self-determination. Only a state would Palestinians acquire the standing, only with a state would Palestinians acquire they need, what they needed to regain their legitimate rights. The beginning of the Israeli occupation in 1967 marked a fundamental change in my father. No, no, no longer was he apathetic about politics as he had become in the late 1950s when he was living under Jordan's rule. He found new energy and once again applied himself to political work. A few weeks after the Israeli occupation, he submitted a proposal to establish a Palestinian state next to Israel along the 1947 partition borders with its capital in Arab Jerusalem, Arab section of Jerusalem and hold negotiations over all other outstanding issues. The UN Partitions Plan of 1947 had recognized the rights of the Palestinians to a state, just like Israel's. Why not invoke this now, he argued, declare a state according to that partition plan, and negotiate with Israel? Self-determination is a fundamental right of every nation, so why deny it to Palestinians? When he visited Jaffa after 1967, he saw that he was, it was basically unchanged, looking more or less just as when he had left it in 1948. It was not too late for a Palestinian state. He got the support of 50 prominent Palestinian leaders from the different parts of the occupied territories, handed the proposal to two Israeli emissaries to present to the Israeli government and awaited the response. All my father's previous work on the Palestinian case led him to this bold and courageous conclusion. But it, went, but it went against the revolutionary zeal that was sweeping the Palestinian diaspora in the immediate aftermath of the war. As soon as his plan became known, insults and accusations were hurled at him from all sides for proposing the establishment of a Palestinian state next to Israel. As a 16-year-old, unaware both of my father's political activities after the Nakbe and of his work on behalf of the refugees, I wanted to give vent to the raw hatred I felt toward Israel as the occupier of our land, but I couldn't. I had to be calm, unemotional, resilient, and supportive of my father. Later, I would come to appreciate how strongly my father believed that it was incumbent upon him to speak and act. He was a pioneer ahead of his peers. Surely the future has vindicated his belief that it would be difficult and possibly even futile to try to win rights without the backing of his state. In 1967, there was not yet a single Israeli settlement in the occupied territories. Now the establishment of a Palestinian state next to Israel has become the official PLO strategy. Yet, after some three quarters of a million Israeli Jews have moved to live in settlements in the West Bank, 
this goal, alas, has come to be unattainable. Now with hindsight, I know how unrealistic my father's plea was. Far-fetched, yes, for sure. Yet I cannot but wonder, what if? What if he had been successful? What horrors we would have all been spared? And what instigation for hatred of Arab by Jew and Jew of Arab that went on afterwards to serve purposes of leaders on both sides. Instead, we could have learned how to live together and respect each other's cultures and our mutual land would have flourished. The period after my father's murder was the most shattering and arduous of my life. This was not only because of the emotional impact on me personally and professionally of losing my father and the senior partner at the law office, but also due to the long and futile process of following the Israeli investigation of the murder. That has continued to this day with the most recent petition for an Israeli high court for an order Naisai to show cause why the Israeli police is denying me access to review the investigation file into the murder of my father. It was also a time when I was witnessing the slow transformation of our country and the destruction of our future in it. The building of Israeli settlements and their infrastructure of roads, water, and electricity was devastating the landscape. These were years filled with anxiety and worry about our future. We watched our world being changed before our eyes. The area left for us in it consist constantly shrinking, bending even more remote the possibility of establishing there the Palestinian state that my father had envisioned. What then became of the road plan number 50, which I mentioned at the outset. After many years of the Israeli, after many years, the Israeli court to which my father and I submitted the objection against the plan was able to come to a decision rejecting our appeal. Meanwhile, the Israeli authorities were proceeding with building new roads that connected the settlements together and to Israel, bypassing Palestinian towns and villages. In the process, they wrecked our landscape, carving wide highways through the soft, attractive hills. The city of Hebron is a case in point. I first heard of the plans for the old city of Hebron in the early 80s and how they proposed to connect Kiryat Arba with the old city. I thought it was a pipe dream impossible to realize. Now they seem to have achieved it. Then I thought the settlers would have to live in a ghetto in the old city of Hebron, surrounded by over 200,000 Palestinians living in Hebron. Now I know that the plan Israel implemented connected their, their settlements together and to Jerusalem and created out of Arab Hebron and the other cities and villages enclaves. The Palestinians are the ones living in enclaves which are becoming more like ghettos in the new geography Israel has created, which it had planned as early as 1984, the time of the road plan number 50. My father's experience of witnessing the transformation of the West Bank from being part of the, Palest of the Palestine he knew to being annexed to Jordan mirrored my own experience of the same territory as it was transformed after the Israeli occupation of 1967. And yet it has taken me many years to realize the similarity in our experiences that could have brought us closer together. It was the writing of this book, my love letter to my father to get there. As I was finishing my book, an imaginary conversation with my father went through my head. I assured him that history had proven him wrong. The occupier has won. The word occupation has been dropped from Israel's vocabulary. The curriculum taught in their schools tells their students that the whole of greater Israel is theirs and that the Palestinians have no rights over that land and that they don't really, and that they don't really exist. And what is more, in the words of Israel's finance minister, Bezalel Smortrick and others, they are fictitious, a fictitious nation invented only to fight the Zionist movement. It's quite strange for me as a Palestinian to think of myself in this light. Last year, the world watched as 25,000 Israelis marched through the old city, declaring that Jerusalem is for Israelis alone, shouting death to Arabs, and banging on the metal shutters of Palestinian shops and the restaurants with sticks and flagpoles. By the time the marchers had moved on toward the Western Wall, 
Israeli flag stickers and graffiti featuring the Star of David in blue, blue paint and pen had been left behind on doors and walls, as well as in the plaza in front of Damascus Gate. This year, on 25 February, some 400 settlers from Israeli settlements next to the Palestinian town of Hawara, where the two settlers from the nearby Harbrocha settlement were murdered that day by Palestinian militants, went on a five-hour rampage of revenge without being stopped by the Israeli police, army or police. One Palestinian was killed and some 100 injured, including four in serious condition. At least 15 houses were burned, one with the family still inside. Commenting on the program, Israel's National Security Minister Itmar ben Gvir said, our enemies need to hear a message of settlement, but also one of crushing them one by one. I want to tell my father, you underestimated Israel's powers and resourceful, resourcefulness and long-term planning. This is what I imagine would be his response. You say that they've won because they deny the Palestinians any rights over the land and have dropped you out of their consciousness. This only means that you, they've succeeded in deceiving you as well. You think that because they made you invisible, they've won? It means, pains me to hear you put it like that. This is a recipe for perpetual war. Don't you realize that the only victory is the achievement of peace between our two peoples? How it saddens me to see that the only relations between you are those of master and slave, relations of hatred and exploitation. And yet you call this denial of Palestinians their victory. The only real victory is when we both won. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Reza, for that uh, very moving reading. Um, I'm just going to say a few words. We have uh, the better part of, uh, of a half an hour to, to take questions. I just want to say a couple of things about this really quite wonderful book. I mean, I've always enjoyed reading uh, Reza's writing, especially uh, his writing in this vein, where he's both meditating about politics and history, but bringing in a personal uh, aspect. Um, and this book is a is several things at once. It's a wonderful biography of the of the distinguished lawyer Aziz Ishadi of his father, uh, and of the things that this man did uh, in the course of his career. Some of the things that he did, um, and he's a he's a he's a, a figure who deserves much more attention. And Reza has very respectfully uh, given him that attention, talking about some of the things he did. And and the reading that you just did, Reza, I think reflects a little bit. Uh, of what you'll find if you have a chance, uh, those of you listening, to, to read the book. But it's also a wonderful, I guess, meditation uh, on the reflection, uh, a meditation, I should say, on the relationship between a father and a son. Um, very, very touching, very moving. Um, because what Reza says in this book is that he never fully appreciated his father in his lifetime. And it's really only going through his papers, as he did after the man passed away, that he fully appreciated his father. And so this is a sort of a, a, a posthumous, I won't say love letter, but a posthumous uh, personal message to his father and to everybody who has the, the, is lucky enough to have the opportunity to read this book uh, about a relationship between a son and a father. But the third thing that Reza does in this book, and this is the, the most amazing thing to me as a historian, is that he weaves into this personal narrative and into this biography of Aziz Ishadi, his father, um, an enormous amount of history. And he's just touched on a few of the aspects of the history that it's a very slim book. And yet there are aspects of the relationship between Jordan and the Palestinians. There are aspects of uh, Israeli planning and it's uh, diabolical forward-looking uh, 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 plan to absorb and uh, uh, completely strangle and destroy Palestine in, in the interest of turning it into the greater land of Israel. Uh, so in the context or in, in the process of, of writing about his father and writing about his relationship with his father, he is at the same time giving us pages and pages and pages 
of first person history, some of it drawn from the documents that he uh, had a chance to look at and then he finally looked at, looked at after his father passed away. Um, and it's spot on as history. Um, the idea that the Palestinians um, are supported by Arab governments is a falsehood, which in fact, his father always understood and always fought against. Uh, uh, Aziz al-Shadi understood this from the very beginning. Uh, Reja shows to the extent to with which this is true through his description of what Jordan did at different stages uh, of his father's life, um, not just to his father. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's, it, it, this should be required reading. Uh, you know, there are very good books about some aspects of what he's been talking about. Um, Abi Shlaim has written a wonderful book uh, called King Abdullah the Zionist Movement and the Partition of Palestine. Mary Wilson has written a wonderful book, uh, uh, King Abdullah Britain and the Making of Jordan. Um, these will give you chapter and verse of some aspects of the Jordanian role. But uh, in this book, what Reja has done is to illustrate it through his own personal experiences, through the personal experience of, experiences of his father, uh, which he discovered uh, through looking at his father's papers. Um, the, 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 the Plan 50 that he talked about, I happened to have been in Palestine recently, and I went up some of those roads that were first planned in 1984. Um, the road up the Jordan River Valley, uh, the Alon Road, uh, others uh, created so as to create, as, as Reja put it, uh, uh, an Israeli matrix within which the Palestinians would be uh, in tiny enclaves, surrounded, restricted, uh, and increasingly restricted. Uh, that restriction is not complete. It continues. I mean, I've seen Mari Adomim, the settlement between Jerusalem and Jericho expand and expand and expand over the years. Uh, most recently, when I saw it, it was so much bigger than it had been the last time. And that's true of settlements all over. So this, this, this constriction of the Palestinians into enclaves, or better described as you did, Reja, as ghettos, um, is an ongoing process. It's not done. It continues all the time. New settlements are being established. New outposts are being established. Existing settlements are being expanded. There are cranes. Uh, at work in many, many, many of these Israeli settlements, building more settler units, expanding into more stolen land, and so on and so forth. And this book is not a description of those things per se, but in the course of, of, of describing his father's life and his relationship with his father, uh, Reja gives us, I think, wonderful insights into some of these processes. So I will stop here. Um, I suggest that you um, type your questions into the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screens. Uh, and we will take as many questions as we have. We have at least until 12, uh, until 1.15. We can even go on a few minutes after that if, 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 if there, if there uh, is, is, is enough interest. So please, uh, for the 70 something of you, 73 people are participating. Uh, any of you who have any questions, um, uh, I'm sure Reza would be very happy uh, to, to take them. Um, uh, as you can see in the chat function, um, you're told to please send your questions through the Q&A function, and we'll do our best uh, to get to, to all, all of the questions. Um, let me see what we have here. Uh, from Fiamma, um, we have a question. I'll read it out, and Reza, you can, you can respond to it. From the pages Reza read, we also experience his forgiveness towards a father who basically wasn't able to pay attention to and listen to his son. Uh, Reja allows the admiration for the human rights work his father did to prevail. Uh, could you please comment on this, Reja? Father. Well, uh, the admiration for my father came later as, as, uh, as I tried to explain, because at the time of the 84, I wasn't aware at all of his, uh, his experiences in, in resisting in earlier. Uh, with Jordan and with uh, the uh, right of return and all of that. So the admiration came later and uh, and the book was a vehicle and a way through which I got to admire him more and more because I read his papers and, uh, and in the course of writing, I, I the relationship grew between us really and, and developed and, and so I uh, now feel greatly uh, admiring of my father, which which I kept wondering why wasn't I admiring before because he had been through such difficulties and I could see 
I could, could have. I could have seen the difficulties that he went through, but I was not sympathetic. And I, the question was, why wasn't I sympathetic? And it was mainly because I was more on my side of my mother who was uh, suffering for, for uh, her husband's uh, activities and, and complained about them. And I took her side and I listened to the complaints and I didn't realize that uh, there's another side because my father did not tell me at the time what, what was happening and what he was experiencing. And that's, and that's partly why the relationship was not uh, so strong between us. Let me let me pose another question from Jean Bleich, I think it is. Uh, thank you so much for reading for your, from your book, Mr. Shahadi. I look forward to reading it. Where did you, your father and your grandfather, I think you, your uncle, uh, study law? Uh, and then a second question, what legal system is Israeli law based on? Thank you. Um, well, I studied law in London. My father studied law in Jerusalem, in the, the law classes, which the British had established. And uh, the system in Israel of, uh, is based on the uh, civil, uh, civil law system, which, is the, uh, which was uh, put in place by the British mandate. And Israel continued to apply it and, and uh, developed it by uh, adding to the laws. And, and uh, so the system now is uh, still Anglo like, uh, mainly the Anglo-Saxon system with additions of uh, new laws. Uh, many new laws, of course, uh, were added later on. I, I would add that in the occupied territories, you have the remnants of the Ottoman legal system as well. You have the remnants in the Gaza Strip of some aspects of Egyptian military law. You have some aspects of Jordanian law as well that occasionally are relevant. And then you have Israeli military law, which is not, which is a, a beast of its own creation. Uh, so whereas in Israel, as Rajan said, you have law based essentially on British civil law. Um, for Palestinians in the occupied territories, a whole different set of, of legal systems obtain. And that's because Israel never annexed the, uh, fully annexed the Palestinian areas. That's right. But the Israeli law does not apply. Let me pose uh, another question to you. This is from Fred Bogan. He asks, thank, he says, thank you for such an interesting presentation. Can you say something as to why the Palestinians have received little or no support from Arab countries? The Arab countries had it, it, it's different at different parts, points in time. And uh, Rashid is a historian, he knows better than me. But <laughs> But in the beginning, the fight between the Arab countries was that they did not want King Abdullah to expand his uh, kingdom. And they were worried about the expansion of the kingdom into uh, greater Syria and so on. And so they, they fought him on that basis. Later on, the uh, Arab countries did not want Palestine to be a separate state and a democratic state because a democratic state would uh, reflect badly on their undemocratic states in the Arab uh, region. So the different reasons at different points in time. Yeah, I, I would stress the last thing that I said myself as a historian. Um, the Arab world uh, is unfortunately plagued by a variety of non-democratic regimes, uh, from absolute monarchies in the Gulf to military or police state dictatorships. Um, and the last thing they want is democracy. And they fought very hard against democracy. Uh, they're fighting very hard against democracy when it, several Arab regimes were overturned starting in 1911. That's uh, 2011, sorry. In 2011, um, they uh, put all of their energy into stifling uh, uh, any, any democratic outcomes in Egypt and in other countries that witnessed these upheavals. Um, and this is an enormous problem for the Palestinians because there is great sympathy for Palestine among Arab public opinion. There are poll after poll, there's poll after poll after poll that shows that sympathy. But these regimes, which are unrepresentative of their people, um, have their own narrow regime or family or personal interests, uh, which they put ahead of their people's views or, or uh, uh, certainly the question of Palestine. Um, let me read you a couple of comments. Um, these, are not, uh, these are not questions, but just so I'm gonna read them out. I want to thank Mr. Shadi for giving us such an honest biography of his father and the relationship between both of them. 
at the time, keeping a rich political and historical perspective. I saw and bought this book at Beirut Airport, and I read it, my flights back to Chile. This is uh, a Chilean, Palestinian, Marcela Marzuka. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Another person says, phenomenal book title. No question, just a comment. Thanks. Now, here is a question from Anoha Miley. Um, do you think that your relationship with your father is a typical Arab father-son relationship? Well, that's a good question because, yes, there are aspects of it that are because Arab fathers do not uh, are not usually uh, getting into this business of uh, uh, getting closer to the the sons and and uh, giving them love and hugs and so on. There's there's a distance between an Arab father, traditional Arab father, and the son, and also the attempt to explain things to the son is not usually. Uh, maybe now it's changing with, with the new generation, but at, in, in my time, it wasn't common for the, for the father to sit with the son and explain things and to uh, be uh, intimate and, and hugging and, and uh, expressing uh, love and so on. And, and the idea was the father is responsible for the son's welfare and well-being and for providing for him. And if he does that, then he's done everything that is needed to be done. And, and, and then the son is on, on his own. In my case, I wanted to be to have a relationship with my father that was untraditional. I wanted to speak everything out with him and discuss things and 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 get closer. And I, he he didn't have time for this. And he didn't he's, he wasn't an intro, uh, introspective person. He was a, a doer and a, a, an extrovert. And I was totally the opposite, an introvert, and introspective, and so on. And so we we didn't go along very well together in that sense. Yeah. Um... In, in my last book, um, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, I reflect a little bit, much, much less than you do, Reja, um, on my relationship with my father. And uh, he, he would talk about what he was doing at the United Nations in his own work. But he would talk mainly to my mother and my grandmother. And we were just sitting there at the table. We had the privilege of listening. But we were not asked. We were not supposed to be asking questions, or you know, we were supposed to listen. Uh, and when he did take me aside and say something to me, for example, um, when he was very ill and he knew he was dying, uh, he sat me down and told me a story about his meeting with uh, King Abdullah in 1947. I paid a, a great deal of attention because, exactly as I just said, it was not common for a father of his generation to talk to his children uh, and talk and tell them directly. Uh, about things. And so I, I, this was to me exceptional, and I remembered it very vividly. Um, and I, re I, I recount the story in, in, the, in, the, in my book, The Hundred Years War, where I'm talking about the 19, uh, 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 where I'm talking about the partition plan and Abdullah's role in it. Um, yes, I remember that story from your book. Yeah. And I enjoyed reading it very much. There was also <laughs> another aspect, which was that under Jordan, like in, uh, under any, uh, m many other repressive regimes, there's fear, and there's fear that if you tell the children something and they repeat it in public, then it would create problems for the family because, because uh, these things were uh, not supposed to be told in public. And so right. it kept things from us for that reason also. Right. I mean, you're talking about states where the rule of the muhabarat of the secret police is almost absolute. They have absolute power. Um, King Abdullah, the current king, Abdullah of Jordan, actually, in an unguarded moment, said to an interviewer, I don't even control the Muqabarat in Jordan, mm -hmm. which is absolutely true. I know this from uh, events in Jerusalem where various issues have come up, um, where the Jordanian uh, controlled uh, al al Ammi, the, the waqf that controls, uh, or supposed to control, the Haram al-Sharif and many other things in East Jerusalem is concerned. And it is perfectly clear that neither the court, nor the prime minister, nor the government, nor the parliament has any control over the Muqabarat, which controls uh, the Awqaf al-Ami. The Awqaf al-Ami is an extension in, in the Jordanian case of the secret police, not of the state, not of the government, not even of the king. By his own admission, I'm not, I'm not saying anything that King Abdullah himself hasn't said. Um, and that's the case in most, unfortunately, in most Arab countries. Um, I had, there's a, there are no more questions. Well, I do see some more. Here we are. Um, uh, first, a comment from Maysay Ali, a distinguished historian, friend of, of mine. She says, 
thank you, Reja, for putting your father's history and struggle towards the cause in its proper uh, aspect. Uh, this is highly appreciated. Um, and here's a question from Mais al Alami. She says, within this context, do you fear that Palestinian oral history is dissipating through the generations and that it might impact the path forward for Palestinian knowledge production and the liberation struggle? Well, fortunately, there's many people doing oral history now and, and saving what needs to be saved from people's memories and knowledge from the time that they lived through it. And so uh, I don't have that fear anymore, but I think it's still more can be done and should be done because the generation of 48 of those who went through the Nakbe is, is dying now and is, is getting old. And so they need to be asked and, and interviewed and recorded and uh, uh, kept in, in, in uh, on record because it's a very valuable. Uh, right, uh, right. The, the, the American University in Beirut has a wonderful archive. Of, uh, of interviews with uh, survivors of the Nakba, um, which is composed of multiple archives that they brought together. Um, and they're accessible uh, via the American University of Beirut Library. And there are other similar uh, oral history archives uh, in Palestine. Um, I believe Birzit has one, Birzit University has one, and there are several others. Um, but I would encourage anyone who has older relatives who have memories uh, of this or any other period, to listen to them, ask to ask them questions, and to write them down. When these people are gone, those memories will 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 disappear. Um, let me see if we have any. I see we have another question. Yeah, um, it's more a comment than a question. Let me read it. Our relationships with our fathers and grandfathers, this problematic tough love pattern, is something. This is from Aya Al Hawash. Uh, something that I'm currently working towards in my art projects through photographs, poetry, and stories in the Palestinian Lebanese community. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, okay, um, I don't see any more questions right now. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say, um, Reja, uh, in conclusion? I, I have a few things I, I, I would like to say in conclusion. If, if there are no more questions, please, folks, do feel free to ask questions if you have any more. Um, we're gonna be closing up, we're gonna be uh, wrapping up in a few minutes. Raja, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, well I'd just like to thank you, Rashid, for this wonderful uh, interview and uh, talk and, and for center also for, the, for inviting me to speak. Thank you very well, much. It, it was certainly our pleasure. Um, I, I, I think this is really one of your most touching books. I think it's one of your most personal books, all your books are personal. I mean, to a lesser extent, the ones that are that are really legal and technical. Uh, but all the rest of your of the many books that you've written are very personal. And, and many of them are very, I think, touching. The book Palestinian Walks was recognized globally for its for its merit. Um, but this one, um, really, besides delivering just a wonderful slice of the, the history of your father's extraordinary life, uh, and, and besides delivering a, a wonderful account of the relationship between you, uh, does a remarkable job of illuminating aspects of Palestinian history that very, very few people know about. This very complicated and difficult Palestinian-Jordanian relationship, for example, uh, especially in its early years, which you chronicle through your father's uh, terrible experiences with Jordan, um, is 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 something that I think people would benefit from in, in addition to all the other aspects of the book. Um, so we are we are talk I've been, we've been talking, we've had the privilege of talking to really one of the most uh, prolific um, and I would add distinguished the Palestinian writers, uh, somebody who uh, has chronicled so many aspects of life in Palestine uh, under occupation, both from legal a legal perspective, but more importantly from a personal perspective. I want to thank all the participants. Uh, we had 70 odd people who had the benefit and privilege of, of sitting in with us today. Uh, and I want to thank you, Raja, for giving us the time. Um, thank you very much, Rashid. Thank you're you. You're very welcome. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a